Please welcome first to the stage a gentleman named Ron Francis. Ron Francis. <laughs> Whoever you like. Okay. See, I'm already in trouble. Ron Francis is the general manager of the Seattle Kraken, a position he has held since July 2019. After a first ballot Hall of Fame playing career, he worked his way up the Carolina Hurricanes organization, working in player development, scouting, coaching, and operations over his 12 years with the team. In 2014, Francis was named general manager of the Carolina Hurricanes, a position he held until 2018. So we've all heard of this guy, right? Pretty good thing going on right now with the crack and run. It's going well. So far, so good, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, next up, I'm thrilled to welcome Nate Brookerson to the stage. Nate is the head strength and conditioning coach for the Seattle Kraken, a position he has held since November 2020. Hey. <laughs> and there is nothing more intimidating than going to the hotel gym when you're on the road and Nate's in there already working out. Nate oversees the performance training and monitoring for our athletes. Prior to joining the Kraken, Nate was the Assistant Athletic Director of Strength and Conditioning for Olympic Sports at North Carolina State University, where he supervised strength and conditioning and sports science for over 500 student athletes. Prior to NC State, he worked at the University of Memphis and Eastern Washington University. He received a degree in exercise science from Central Washington University, where he was a member of the football team. He has a master's from Eastern Washington University. He is a certified, drop the puck, <laughs> strength and conditioning coach through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Welcome, Nate. Thank you. We are also thrilled, I'm impressed we could get this one off the road, Chris McDonald. Chris, come join us. Chris is an amateur scout for the Seattle Kraken. He previously held the role of Director of European Scouting for Arizona in the 2019 to 20 season. And he has also served as an amateur scout for the Vancouver Canucks from 2012 to 2019. Chris is a former Western Michi Michigan captain. He was drafted by the Calgary Flames in 1983, 151st overall. And after a career cut short by injury, he was involved in coaching at the junior and college level. Welcome, Chris. And last but certainly not least, I already got a shout out earlier today, Tim Ohashi, the video coach for the Seattle Kraken. <laughs> Tim's hockey career began in 2014 when he was an intern on the Washington Capitals coaching staff. In 2015, he joined the Capitals full time as a video analyst. Tim is a 2018 Stanley Cup champion and worked for the Capitals until 2020 when he was hired by the Seattle Kraken. Tim graduated from Bates College in 2011 where he also played club hockey. Please welcome our esteemed panel. All right, well Ron, I'd like to start with you if we can. You've been around this sport for so long in so many different ways. When it comes to the information that we're using these days to evaluate this game and these players, how can you describe the journey of what you've seen this game taking in terms of how you do the analysis you need to do? Um, well, first of all, I am old. Um, the first time, I think, receiving any kind of data as a player. I started in 1981, and it would be our NHL scout that would scout the visiting team like the game before we played him and then he would send that via fax to our coach and then we would have that sort of posted in the locker room and that's kind of how we were educated on, on the team we were playing that night. Of course as your career goes along things change. You got more I think video based as, as I got towards the end of my career um, but not really a lot of the analytics coming into play or that data coming into play until more after I was retired and, and more on the management side. So been a big change from the fax machine to, to where we are now with the, uh, the R&D teams on all the teams. So it's, uh, it's uh, an exciting progression for the game. Nate, I'll ask you, you have to work very hands-on with your athletes. How do other types of information, other than the actual work being done by their bodies, what do you look for, what do you use, how do you apply it to the players? 
I think one of the things you learn working in athletics for a long time is to have the least amount of touch points with an athlete on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they're not lab rats. They, they don't want to you know, ask, be asked a ton of questions. They don't want to be you know, in front of a computer screen. So it has to be things that fit within kind of their day-to-day -day, you know, structure. So you know, we, we have very few touch points, but we look at things like perceived recovery scale. Uh, we'll look at RPE from a practice. Uh, we'll look at just simple things like body weight. Um, and then, you know, we'll take measures off the ice, external load, internal load, just to see kind of the workload that they're doing, the cost of doing business. And really a lot of it with the interaction with the athletes is around heuristics. So it's just talking about, you know, how do you feel? You know, how are we looking on the ice? What were kind of the goals and the intent of things coming into the off, off season, going into in season? What are things that we're working on now? Do we feel like we're moving in the right direction? So just keeping you know, a lot of complex data fairly simple in terms of that interaction. Nate and I had a funny story. I was talking to a player in the room about something they worked on off season. And I said, did you get better? Do you know you did? And he said, ask him. <laughs> and the answer was yes, I do believe. Chris, how about for you? You have to take in data from so many different sources. You're not just looking at a skater. You're looking at an individual. You're looking at a support structure around them. What information is important, to, necessary to you, I guess I should say, for you to feel like you have everything you need? Well, you get a lot of numbers, for sure. When you go into a rink, uh, anytime you can look at the stats, there are a lot more detail, as Ron mentioned, than they were years ago, for sure. And you have access to that instantly, all the time on your phone to follow, even when you're not at that particular game. So those numbers mean something. But, but obviously, you've got to trust your eyes and, at times, probably ignore your ears. Because when you're, you're watching someone and you skating jumps out at you first because that's the thing you probably notice but there's other things you want to watch and evaluate to make sure that's something that transfers to the NHL. Tim, when you joined this organization there was not yet a hockey team. We heard earlier today that you were such an important voice as this group was starting to develop a lot of their internal systems and processes. What did you do before there were games to scout and opponents to scout? And you can't be humble here, Tim. I wish I'd heard what was said earlier, so I wouldn't. Hmm. Uh, no, it was, it was awesome getting an opportunity, obviously, to work for an expansion franchise and something different for me and I think uh, most people in the organization. Uh, it gave me an opportunity a year where we didn't have the day-to-day -day of the coaching world. We were worried about, you know, 18 skaters or up to 20 skaters, whatever it may be, where we could kind of do deep dives in uh, certain things from a more analytical perspective. and. I got to work with a lot of really intelligent people who know a lot of things that I don't know and try and lend you know, my own experience and let them build off that, adding the perspective of, okay, maybe this player or this team struggles in this area because it's something that's coached or it's something they're being asked to do and kind of adding some balance to that perspective uh, bas basically based on what I see off video. Ron, when you're building a team, you got to build this from scratch and you have all these people like this who all need different kinds of information. How did you tackle making sure that all the parts of your team had all the tools they need, be that information or systems or all of those? Well, I, I think the first thing is finding the right people. Um, you know, it's, it's a key part of organization. We want guys with character, whether it's working, uh, I should say guys and girls, I would be corrected by Alex if I didn't say that. but. Um, you know, uh, our people, we want to have character individuals. Um, not everything's going to go smooth. I mean, last year was certainly a challenge, but if you have the character, you keep working through it. You keep trying to find solutions, and, and you've seen by uh, the people on the panel here and the people that have put this on and worked for us all day. I mean, they are character individuals, and I think that's a key factor in building anything you do. Um, you know, I think all these guys are being a little modest, like Tim coming on board a year early was also part of building everything that we had to do in regards to our video room, our coaches' war room, where to put the TVs, where to put wires, where to have you know, cameras and so on and so forth, um, not only at CPA but also at KCI. So it was a lot of things that we had to do um, and getting the right people that were uh, not only good at what they do but also people that were fun to work with and, and uh, as I said, character individuals made the process so much fun and uh, you know, I think in the long term that's going to help us reap the benefits we want to reap. Did you have a checklist? Did you know, like, I need to get these kinds of roles filled and these kinds of systems in place or did you learn as a team as you built the group up? 
No, part of my uh, interview process um, with the Kraken before I got the job was presenting kind of what I thought everything laid out. So, you know, you have to do the work and lay out exactly what you think your department's going to be, what all the positions are going to entail, uh, when you think you're going to hire those people. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to hire somebody day one if you don't need them till you know, day three. So we kind of go through that process and when you're going to do it. And... Um, you know, got grilled pretty good by, I think, about eight different owners. But at the end of the day, I guess they, they liked what they saw and, and they, they gave me the job. And then we started uh, working on that process. I, I will point out, Alex was here before me. So uh, I wasn't the first person hired. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I didn't scare off once I got the job. So we're all good. <laughs> all right, no pressure, the rest of you. But we'll go down the line because I think these three have pretty cool jobs. What does a day in the life, Nate, look like for you? I'll go uh, practice day because okay. game day is, yep. is and no pressure. Your GM's not right to the side of you or anything it's, like it's that. It's, it's fine. fine. <laughs> uh, you know, when you when you first come in, you're trying to interact with as many constituents as possible. So for me, that's coaching staff and medical. Um, just trying to get in front of them, try to understand. You know, if we have limitations to players or return to play process that we need to be aware of in terms of coaches, what's the plan for practice? Is there going to be anybody that's limited going out early to skate? Uh, once you have that information, then you're going back and you're kind of adjusting your plan. So it's what I call agile periodization. So you have a plan, but it's ultimately, uh, it's, it's going to be you know, process around the information that you're receiving that day. So when the players are coming in, you, you have to be available. So that's around, you know, it could be simple interactions or it could be, you know, invisualized, dialed in warm up process. Uh, once they get out on the ice, then I'm going out to track. And once they come off, then it's, uh, you know, it could be a post-practice uh, training session. And there's typically, you know, individual consults that you're having with athletes around, you know, various topics. And then sending out a training report at the end of the day and then going back and reflecting as a staff to make sure, you know, did we hit everything the right way or something that we need to do better the next day. How long is a practice day for you? I mean, between my workout in the morning and the end of the day, you know, that's it's about, about eight to ten hours. But, you know, the, the workout could be, you know, two hours. No. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Workout? <laughs> Bro, you work out? No, just kidding. <laughs> Chris, do you sleep, I guess I should say. Tell us about your, if there is, even Do I look like I don't? No, I just know how busy you are. This is how it happens, people. No, no, just I know how busy I know how busy you are. I had a little no, purview I'm, into how even getting you here had to work. No, it's uh, today's a good day. Uh, a nice drive from. Um, geez, where was I last night? <laughs> <laughs> Spokane. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> I said Spokane last night. Yeah, see, there you go. That's, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, no, a typical day would be uh, getting to the game, depending on where the where in the world you are and um, watching players. The next day would be getting reports done and getting stuff into the office that they need to see and, and taking into consideration that the numbers are accurate and scores you're giving people and what you're writing is accurate and you're explaining what you're seeing so they can see it as fast as possible from anywhere in the world. So there's a lot of travel to it. Uh, this month's a tough, tough month just the way it's worked out with weather because uh, with travel there's been a couple glitches. So. You're on the road a lot, you're, you're um, doing reports, you're watching video now has changed significantly. When I first started in my first job in Toronto in the early 90s, I never would have thought I'd be downloading games to watch on flights. But now the quality of the video is a lot better and, and you can get caught up or make sure you're seeing people maybe before you see them. So the technology is, and here we have the best, like it's unbelievable what we have access to. So that's really nice, but that's a typical day is get your reports done, get the games watched, and move on to the next game. Do you rely on video? Go ahead, Ron, please. I was just going to say, Chris, Chris is mentioning the, the complications sometimes with weather and travel and so on and so forth. The one thing he's leaving out is there's a lot of unforeseen hazards in, in doing his job. And for instance, last year on, on going to cover a game in Calgary, he saw a stray dog, and he got out of the van to help the stray dog. Proceeded to get bit right in his derriere. <laughs> Still made it to the game. and. Uh, Six weeks later, we're still getting shots for rabies, I believe. It's actually, it's actually, it's true. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to go into that today, but no. Yeah, and if, a, if you want to point out the other scout who locked the van doors once you got out, feel free to do so. <laughs> I'll absolutely throw Jeff Crisp under the bus. 
here and now. Yeah, I took a bite, and uh, rabies shots are nothing you'd want to go through. Uh, but that's what happens. I, I never, yeah, I, I, I blocked that out till Ronnie brought it back. So <laughs> now it's back. There are some hazards to the job you need to be aware of. Chris, you mentioned video. Do you find that your relationship with video has changed since the pandemic when you had to rely on it so exclusively? Do you use it more or less? And if so, why? Well, I think I, I use it about the, the same. I, the year in Arizona when I was living in Europe, they did a lot of video there um, just by nature and, and you got used to having some having to rely on it. So when yeah. COVID came, it wasn't a huge adjustment and now it's here to stay, I think. And I think it's something I know, I'm sure everybody in our organization, if they're not watching live hockey, tend to be watching hockey now on your phone. I, I know for, it's been nice this year, even technology wise to watch our team between periods. Uh, I was actually standing with the LA guy the other night when we were up eight, six, and that was, that was neat. And then, <laughs> for some of us up here, <laughs> I guess when you're watching from three time zones away, it's easier. Put it that way. So no, video, it, it's, the quality's been better and it's, some, it's a great tool. It, it's a lot like the data. It's another piece that you can use to get the best players. Ron, to you too, when you, when you had to go almost exclusively to video during the pandemic, did you, were you relieved to be able to go back to in-person viewings? What's the difference? What can you gather differently between, in your opinion, live or a video? Yeah, and no, I, I still believe live is, is extremely important. I think the video is, is a great supplemental tool. Certainly during COVID, we couldn't get to a lot of live events, but there's things that you can pick up watching a game live that just doesn't get covered on the video. So I do think live is, is you know, whether it's away from the camera, whether it's on the bench, there's things that you can pick up watching a game live that you can't see video, uh, uh, you know, that don't come up on video. Okay, Tim, so you watch exclusively video. Make your case. <laughs> Yeah, I guess my average day is, uh, it's a lot of video. Uh, for every, uh, every opponent we play, we're distributing tens of gigabytes worth of video to our entire coaching staff, and it's just making sure we're prepared for all situations, power play, penalty kill, five on five face-offs, end of game situations, three on three, whatever it may be, we wanna have the requisite video that we can be prepared for whatever may arise during the game, and so a lot of my job involves making sure we have the assets and then cutting it up and distributing it. And then uh, I'll watch three games for every team we play and uh, use that to build a baseline for the meeting that we're going to present to the players that, you know, we hope they'll be able to ingest some of that information and give them a little bit of an advantage on the ice when they go out there. They're not surprised by what the other team's trying to do. Nate talked about having to interface with constituents. Your constituents are coaches and also sometimes the players. When you talk about building that baseline, how, what was your process for identifying, this is what I need to prepare to give this team the best advantage to win? Yeah, I think building relationships with players is huge. At the end of the day, I want them all to trust that they can come to me, ask questions. If something was unclear in the video or in the meeting, they're not embarrassed, afraid, whatever, shy to come and get some clarification because the last thing you want is players that aren't on the same page or you know, guys will text me on a day off, hey, can you send me X or Y? And um, if you don't build those relationships, uh, they're not asking for it and they're not getting it. And the supplemental stuff, I think, is really important for them to get. So building relationships, obviously, with our coaching staff, but also with our players, our trainers, uh, obviously essential as well. And as your question was, sorry. <laughs> Make your case for video how it is, the, in many ways, the main tool you need. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... It's one of the tools. It's, uh, you know, the number of times I, I curse at the video because it doesn't show what I want to see it is high. And I'll, again, it ties to relationship building where I'll text a Eastern Conference counterpart of mine, hey, would you mind sharing the high angle of this game because I can't see what I want to see. And uh, they don't mind because it's first a Western Conference team or whatever it may be. So um, that's certainly important. And then there's the data component as well. And I think they all just kind of work hand in hand. And, paint a more complete picture with the more information we have. It's already been established that Namita had the best panel moderation, so I'm going to steal one from her that Tim set up for me, which is you are each looking for competitive advantage. How do you network with people, colleagues, mentors that you can bounce ideas off of? There's obviously only so much information you're going to share with your colleagues. For each of your positions, where do you find professional inspiration and counsel to be as, as proactive and positive as you can be. Ron? Well, I'm not gonna get a lot of help from my counterparts around the league because <laughs> their job is like mine, it's on the line, right? So um, 
You know, I, I think you, it's the people you hire to work with. Um, you certainly lean on them, I think, the most, but I think you're always looking for, for any way to sort of pick up information and knowledge, right? And we tell our scouts, we tell our staff that. I mean, talk to, you know, if you're looking at scouting a player, I want to talk to the trainers, I want to talk to uh, the equipment managers, I want to talk to their billets. I mean, whoever you can talk to to gather information, information is valuable in our position because it helps us kind of formulate an opinion of a player and is that player going to fit into what we're trying to do here in our culture and our style and you know, um, you know we look at that we look at our internally at our R&D team and what they project you know if it's a pro player we're talking to our pro scouts on what they do and and, and what they see and, and gather so there's a lot of different <clears throat> tools that we have um, but I'm not sure you know my counterparts are calling me for advice or I'm calling them for advice because you know we're, we're, we're battling and competing against each other. Nate, how about you? Can you leverage from other sports as well? Uh, I hope so, yeah, because I was <laughs> around a lot of them before. Um, I think, just reiterating what Ron said, I think internally, I think you have to you look there first within your organization because there's just so many experts in their respective areas that you can learn so much from sitting down and talking to a Tim. You know, I remember when I first got hired, I asked him to send me video of different discrete things that were happening on the ice. Like, can you show me what, you know, this speed forward looks like you know, and, and he's clipping video and he has it to me within a day. So, you know, just being able to leverage knowledge from people within the organization first. Uh, I would say another big group for me is the private coaches that they go and see in the off season. Um, a lot of them have really good relationships, long standing relationships with the players. You know, some of these guys have worked with their players for, you know, since they were 14, 15 years old. So they have a knowledge base of like, okay, what's their progression been? What is their focus in the off season? What does their training look like? What do they value? What's their work ethic? So being able to, to you know, glean that information from those people. And a lot of times, you know, there's, I don't know if it's an ego thing, but you know, within the, the NHL and the private sector, they just don't communicate a lot of times. So I don't have any problem picking up the phone and just you know, having those conversations as well. I was going to ask you, do you ha how do you manage when maybe to start, you and that trainer or those interfacing people are maybe not on the same page for the goals that everyone has for the player? I mean, I would ask them to go back to, I mean, this is an analytics conference and we're talking about data. Like, give me, give me your rationale as to why these things need to be, you know, worked on. What's, if we're talking about, again, going back to the heuristics, what is, you're saying fitness is an issue. What, what do you mean by fitness? What did you measure? You know, their mobility, their, their strength, their power, whatever that is. Because if we're, we're leveraging different tools to try to describe something similar, and we're not seeing the same things, then obviously uh, we'll have a, a little bit of disconnect. So just being able to get on the same page there and understand you know, what, what they're seeing and, and most times just having, you know, okay, and understanding, okay, that tool is telling me this and, and maybe it's just a little bit different than what I'm looking at. Scouts are such a respected group in this league, in this sport. Do you just interface with just your colleagues here at the Kraken? Are there other people that you can go to to hone your craft? No, it's very competitive. That filters its way down. <laughs> But we don't share information, obviously. We spend a lot of time lying to each other, <laughs> quite frankly. And some people are really good at it. So, <laughs> that's true. So you, it you is get, true, yeah. So what you have to do is, is listen closely, not speak very much, decide what's true, and then eventually decide if it matters. And eventually it gets to the point where it's in Ron's chair and deciding whether it matters. And when it's a character issue, it's very clear it matters great deal here but when you're listening to players inevitably you'll go to it especially a tournament at the start of the year and the running joke is you'll run into everyone and all oh, oh, this tournament's terrible there's no players here. there's no players here and then we go to the draft and they take a guy in the second round <laughs> so clearly there's a player there so I, that's what I mean by we don't share but some people do and if you're in the right place at the right time you might pick something up and get to the bottom of whether it matters or not Tim you already shared some of the interfacing you do with your colleagues. Are there other ways that you do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the person I spend the most time around is my uh, Brady Morgan. He works uh, he's about arm's distance away from me at pretty much all times, whether it's on the plane, uh, in the office, at the game. Uh, so he's someone that um, just through working together with him now in our second season, we see the game in a similar way, that it's easy to bounce ideas off of one another. and. It's a good confirmation check of, hey, are you seeing this as well? Or am I crazy? Does this look like that? Um, and just other ways, I think just with the fluidity of coaching around the league, it only takes a few years and all of a sudden you know men and women on staffs and 
tens of teams and uh, it's a good way to build your network and you, you chat and you know there's some stuff you're a little bit more frank with than others but fortunately if you ask someone hey how is your video room set up they're pretty open and honest about that and um, you can kind of pick and choose what would you change uh, certainly the, that first year that we talked about a little bit earlier when we were building everything from the ground up people were pretty honest and open and I reached out to people in Vegas especially in Edmonton and Detroit and some of these newer buildings on what were the struggle points you had what did you like what would you do differently and you know tried to avoid those mistakes as much as we could and uh, but there's certain areas that you're a little bit more guarded on and uh, you know everybody lies <laughs> It's a great takeaway here from the conference. <laughs> Tim, when you're looking at video, are you looking for specific events? We heard from Corey Schneider earlier who tracks so many of those minute details. Are you looking for events? Are you looking for sequences? Are you looking for both? Yeah, it's a balance. Um, I think big picture, I'm looking at the structure a team plays within and what are their systems? What do they look like in the neutral zone, in the defensive zone, in the offensive zone? What are ultimately the things that we think their coaches are telling their players to do, how they want to play? And within that, where are their strengths and where are their vulnerabilities? Because that's ultimately what is, we're trying to find stuff that's going to be actionable for our players. If we think there's something that they're doing or not doing very well in the defensive zone, we want to capitalize on that. We want to make it very clear to our players this is an area we could exploit potentially and vice versa. What are their strengths? What do our players need to know? Because we've, we've got young players. It's a Twitter generation, whatever. It's attention spans aren't that long. We can't sit them down for three hours and go over a full game. We've got to pick and choose and be as concise and meaningful as we can in a short amount of time. Ron, you already talked about, did you have something to say first? I'll no, just say one thing Tim hasn't talked about, that he and Brady are also responsible during games. They sit in our sort of coach's war room and they're watching the game. So if there's any challenge coming on offsides or challenge on goal interference or a missed high stick in the offensive zone or, you know, the defensive zone for the offensive team, things like that, they're, they're picking that up and radioing that to the bench as well. And a lot of teams around the league, they all do that as well. So it's, a, it's an integral part of their job as well. And, and they've had some pretty key calls this year that have, have, have gone our way, which is great to see. Do we understand goaltender interference? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> no. Depends and if they what do, they're they lying. Like. We're back to lying. Again. More lies. <laughs> Tim, your thoughts? Depends on the day of the week. <laughs> Ron, you talked about building this team and building your internal Kraken team. One of the things that's been brought up today is that no one number in this case tells the story and also that you might need different specialists to build a team. When you look at building an on-ice product, how do you make sure all of the pieces fit together and that it's not, you're, you're certainly not looking for just one thing, but how do you find the elements that you need to bring together to find success? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, there's so many different parts of a team and, and how it works. And you've got five on five guys that sort of excel there. You've got guys that excel in the power play. You're hoping you have guys that excel on penalty killing and defensive aspects of the game. And you're trying to find all the pieces to fit. Um, I was fortunate enough to play in a couple of teams that won Stanley Cups. The key in any of those teams is getting guys to understand what their role is and accept it. That's the, that's the toughest part because everybody wants to be the power play guy. Everybody wants to put up, you know, 90 points and it's hard for everybody to have that kind of ice time to do that. But if, if you have a team that's kind of working hard and, and working for each other, then, then that sort of bodes well. So you try and find those individuals first and foremost and then the guys that have that ability you know, one guy may be faster than another, but one other guy might be more skilled than another. One guy might be, you know, more hockey sense than another. You try and piece it all together and, and uh, you know, hopefully at the end of the day you get it right. Nate, we have talked about building this organization from the ground up. You had all these new players come in and you had to start from scratch with them and I would presume develop training plans for each of them. What was that process like and was there... I don't want to say freedom because you certainly had your professional rigor, but was it cool to be able to do that, to start from scratch with all of them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the challenge becomes you get players from all these different organizations, and some of them have been with their respective strength coaches, so they have an expectation of this is what training looks like to me, and this is what training looked like when I was here. So you needed to do you know, enough homework, and it was a rigorous process to, you know, I, I talked to probably two-thirds of the strength coaches in the, in the NHL just to talk about, you know, their basics and their process. Uh, but then from there, it's, yeah, you're taking in information through your testing process. 
uh, for us looking at, again, a lot of these profiles of strength and power and, and hip strength and groin strength and all these things to be able to say, okay, you have key performance indicators, but you also have key performance inhibitors. You know, when you look at these athletes, they're, they're typically great across the board, especially good in anything that's anaerobic based. So their ability to, to go all out for 30 seconds to a minute is unlike any athlete that I've ever been around. Uh, but sometimes they might be limited in you know, mobility or, or strength or, or something along those lines where it's like, okay, this is something that could get you exposed on the ice. This is something that we need to bring up to at least a, a basic standard. It doesn't need to be the, the best quality that you have, but it can't be something that's going to uh, you know, be exploited by other teams. So really understanding that and then dialing in process for each person was, yeah, it was, it's been a great process. Does everyone know what anaerobic versus aerobic means? Okay. I had to learn it. I just thought I'd ask. Does anyone want it explained? <clears throat> okay. Can you explain anaerobic versus aerobic, please? Yeah, so just generically, it's, you know, energy system derived, right? So anaerobic is more, you know, glycolytic. It's, it's things that are, are really driven uh, not by um, heart rate and central processes. This is more like how quickly and efficiently you can deliver, you know, blood and oxygen to peripheral musculature and how you can... Uh, be able to do high power output type activi activities. So the limiting factor is typically going to be, you know, metabolic waste. It's not, uh, you know, lactate or lactic acid. Everybody thinks is bad. You and then, can tell them in English if you want. <laughs> <laughs> tell them in English. S Scouting is both aerobic and anaerobic. <laughs> so <laughs> anaerobic, basically more power in, in short, yeah, yep. you know, short timing and aerobic is more, you know, long term things that are more heart rate and, and lung derived. So, you know, that's not necessarily important. To this. <laughs> Jogging versus sprinting. Okay. Chris, while Ron is trying to find all the pieces for his team for the needs it has right now, you're looking at players that may not be front of Ron's roster for some time. So what qualities are you looking for and how do you think about building the strongest prospect pool possible? Well, th my job is, is not to put myself in his chair. That's dangerous because uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, <laughs> 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 won't go into that. But uh, for, for me, uh, to find the best possible player and put a list together and try and do it without bias and prejudice and say these are the best players that I've seen to have a deeper pool than everyone else is the competitive part of it. So, and you're trying to figure out potential. And, and now in the business of potential, a lot of kids nowadays, that 10,000 hour theory, they're already doing that. And they touched on that. They've got coaches in all these different areas. So what's left to improve there sometimes, I think is a little less maybe than it was when I first started. So gathering that all in, my job doesn't change. It's, it's to to contribute and have an opinion and, and bring a list together with, a group, with the rest of the group and with the meeting with Alex and with the data and the whole picture to figure out these are the best prospects, these are the players we want to pick in the draft and if we can have success over the years in the draft, at trade deadline you're always in a position of strength. So again, that's bring the best players and that gives you the best chance and when there's success it's amazing how much easier it is to drive for a long time when the team here is winning. It, it makes a big difference. You mentioned the 10,000 hour theory. Can you share what that is for people who may not know? Yeah, well, the, the books are out there. There's plenty of them outliers where, you know, it used to be if you put 10,000 hours into a, a certain activity or a certain skill, you, you got really good at it and you came close to mastering it. And a lot of kids now, whether it be stick handling or skills or skating or, or skating's changed a great deal in the last 10 years. It's they've got those hours in through private coaches, through resources, whatever. So you're looking at how much maybe are they going to get better? Maybe maybe they're close to tapped out. And that's I don't think that was there 10, 15 years ago. Nate, how much does data that we think of as traditional data inform what you're looking for on video or vice versa? Yeah. Did I say Tim? Nate, also Tim. I'll use smaller words than Nate because I didn't understand a lot of those, but um, I think data is great. I think Chris just alluded to it with the bias part. I think anytime I'm watching video, I try and recognize that there's certain 
types of players that I tend to like more than others and having neutral data helps remove some of those biases from my own perspective and then just watching a team there's we play a certain style of hockey and other teams around the league some are similar some are very different uh, but as you go along your, your coaching career you develop things that you do and don't like and uh, Sometimes it's easy to look at something, oh, I really don't like the way they play. Uh, but maybe it's effective, even if it's not necessarily your style or your brand. Maybe it's still effective, or it's effective because of their roster and their player construction. So having some of that unbiased data to look at and kind of balance what I'm seeing off video is super helpful to not fall into my own traps. This was a cr question that came from the crowd earlier. And we're certainly not going to share secrets, but Ron and Chris, what can you share with us about what goes into developing? We always hear about a draft list or a draft board. What is that process like? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing for me is communication and respect. Um, you know, the, the, the scouts, you have to, from an R&D standpoint, you have to respect how tough their job is and they're out in the field and the, you know, it's, it's the weather, it's getting to the ranks, trying to evaluate young kids that are 17, 18 years old and trying to project what they're going to be like at 22, 23. Um, and conversely, you know, if the scouts just say the R&D team's absolutely wrong, this is what I saw, and, and, and they're wrong, then, you know, we're, we're not getting ahead as an organization. So I think it's that communication between multiple groups and, and the respect. Obviously, they have a directive uh, coming from above them, too, as to certain things we're looking for in players and the type of players we want. Um, so y you have <laughs> multiple, multiple meetings over the course of the season. It starts you know, even years out uh, for a particular draft. These guys are watching players you know, two or three years ahead of when they're going to get drafted. So you're watching the progress. We're having those dialogues. We're, we're building a list. We're tweaking the list. Um, you know, right up until we get to uh, the draft actually that day. So a lot of work goes into it, but I think the biggest thing is, is communication among the groups and, and respect to, you know, just how hard each other's job's doing and, and listening to the, when somebody's talking about certain aspects of a player. Yeah, the only, I totally agree. The only the word I might add to that might be trust is we have a very high level of trust between the, all the different groups and all the different opinions and, and that's great. And I think in most places, that starts high and, and unfortunately for certain teams maybe it goes down and that can lead to trouble and when you trust the people that you're in the room with whether the data they're bringing or the the video or, or the scout or their opinion or the regional person who's seen them 10 times and you saw them twice that trust and respect factor is high and and I have no reason to believe it won't stay high and that's a big deal. Nate you mentioned earlier working with clients and trying to keep checking on motivation and performance what have you learned, or is there maybe something you've learned about not just throwing the data at them, but conveying it in an effective way? It has to be things that matter to them. If it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter how good the data is. So things that matter are things that impact performance positively and things that help them feel healthier and better. So any information that I'm conveying needs to tell the story around, okay, this is we're going in the right direction, we're maybe not going in the right direction, and then it has to have an action item off of it. If it doesn't have something actionable that we're actually going to take on, then it's just in one ear and out the other. So there's a lot of things that we could look at, but we streamline down process to say, what can we actually make actionable and what, what can we actually impact on a day to day? Are there numbers that you do want players to be paying attention to or that you try and say, make this part of the actionable item? Or is that not necessarily required? I don't want to create any neuroticism. I don't want to have players that are worrying about data. I don't, I don't want like the gamification. Yep. Like, honestly, at times you do have players that are really interested in like, okay, what's my heart rate at now, or what you know, what was this, or what was that, and it's like, don't don't worry about it. Just just perform. If it's something that we need to have a conversation around, then we'll have the conversation. But it's not constantly barraging you know them with numbers because. Again, I, it's, it's not something that you want them in the front of their head all the time. Sure. Worry about performance, worry about what's happening on the ice. If we need to have those discussions, we will. And you know, I'm obviously not in your shoes, Chris, but one of my frustrations when I look at lower levels of hockey is the lack of data. Is there information you can't get or maybe you feel isn't accurately, if, for those of us in the public space, that isn't accurately conveying to us who these players are, what they are doing, what they might be? Well, I think you've got access to, to better data than you used to at different leagues. I think that the challenge, and our group's met it with uh, Namita and Alex, is, is trying to figure out 
how those numbers transfer to NHL, but how they transfer into between all the different leagues. That, that's the challenge, I think, on the amateur side is you've got three leagues in Sweden, you've got two leagues in Finland, you've got three leagues in Russia. So when you're looking at players that are playing at a different level, it's not only you're figuring out how are they doing in that league in their country, but how is that going to affect when they come over here. So that's, that's the challenge. We don't have the, the NHL 32 teams, all similar type of data, but we have a lot of data that they have access to that really helps us. So probably in January, it really starts to come into focus more because they've got some time now in the bank. So I look forward to that when we get into our January meetings because I've got a knack of going to bat for someone then I find out they have zero chance of playing in the NHL. <laughs> so <laughs> that seems to be my trick. But <laughs> <laughs> which Alex is probably laughing up there right now. So, but no, it's, it's, it's again, working with people and, and having the sort of the round table concept, it makes a huge difference when you feel you're on the same team. You've worked in Europe and been responsible for that whole other side of the world. Can you just maybe explain how you see the differences in the different leagues in the different countries around the world for those who maybe aren't as exposed other than North American hockey? Well, first, the NHL is obviously the greatest league in the world. It's, not, it's, just, it's just the best, and then that's where people want to be. Uh, when you go into the different leagues in the world, it, that's, that's the challenge. The, the SHL is a very good league in Sweden, but then there's Al Svenskin and Hockeyet, and so they have sort of three levels. The KHL is, is a really good league with some good players, but they tend to be players that have sort of gone through the NHL or about to come here, but that's a whole different landscape now with what's going on in the world. So years ago or that year going into Russia to watch KHL players and VHL players, you also eligible for the draft, you didn't have other considerations. But again, going back to the other question, my job is to evaluate them based on them as players, the, the politics and, and all the other part of it, that's, that's it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, anything to add there on just the different hockey that exists no, I, around the world? One thing just uh, didn't point out, uh, a lot of them are Olympic size ice sheets over in Europe too versus the NHL size, which is a little smaller. So, you know, you're trying to value that or factor that into your evaluation as well. You know, might have an extra 10 feet, uh, you know, might not be as physical a game because of that. How's he going to handle the physical nature of the NHL? So there's a lot of other factors that come into play uh, just besides the cultures of the different countries and the style of play. Tim, I don't think you told us how many hours a day you work. Uh, <laughs> depends on the day. Game days and uh, practice days are different, but uh, usually in before six. And then, uh, you know, on a game day, I leave in the eleven o'clock hour. Or there's little little siesta in between, but uh, hours can be long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll open this up to the group. Again, you all are so specialized, but are there stories you can tear about, share about how you each? have relied or interfaced with each other in decision making or just making plans for your own role? Well, I hired all three of them, so. <laughs> There's still that. here. <laughs> yeah, and no, I, I mean, it's just, well, I really got going into it. Uh, I was living actually in Raleigh at the time when I started the process and with COVID, I couldn't really get out to Seattle. Nate happened to work at NC State University, so we started meeting for coffees at Starbucks. And, and trying to talk about it. He wasn't really familiar with hockey, but every time we met and talked, he had done more research about the game. You know, that impressed me, his willingness to work and learn about it. Um, you know, Chris had the experience in, in working already in the league and in different organizations and experience of being over in Europe. So when you're trying to build a, an amateur staff from scratch, those are all valuable tools you can bring to your, to your forefront. Tim, I knew nothing about, um, you know, I'm looking to get a video coach and somebody goes, hey, this guy in Washington, the number two is really good. He's a guy that you should, you should really talk to. And, you know, you call Washington's GM and you ask for permission if you can talk to him. And Brian McClellan said, you know, I hate to lose him, but yeah, go ahead and interview him. And, you know, Tim and I talked and unfortunately for us, he had some ties out here to the state of Washington and, uh, you know, he and his wife were willing to move out here. So it, it, there's a lot of things that factor into the decisions, but it's, it's getting to know people, having conversations with them, talking about what their job and their duty is going to be and, and doing character references on them and, uh, you know, sort of trying to build that organization the way you want to build. It's, um, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, there's nothing like building a franchise from scratch. Um, I certainly didn't expect COVID to be a part of that process. I mean, that was a complete curveball. I've never been involved in a 
what's it, 40, 41 years, I think I'm involved in the National Hockey League now, and I've never been through a year like last year. It's just, it was nuts from start to finish, and, and uh, you know, hopefully that's behind us now we can move forward. But, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good people in the organization make it fun to come to the work every day. And, you know, you ask these people at the hours, they work, nobody's complaining, right? They love being there. You know, maybe not as long as on some days for sure, but we try and try and offset that with days off or, or different events to, to get some time away too. So, um, but it's, um, you know, there's, there's nothing like sort of being involved in the National Hockey League and, and uh, I think we all love being a part of this organization and, and the league. We'll end on this last question and we will start here, Tim, and we will work down the way. You're, you have a room of people here who we love to dissect information and try and understand this game and these athletes better. From your perspective, what's missing? What are we missing in terms of evaluating this game, these players? And if there's some data that you wish you had, what would that be as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one thing that uh, I think most people pretty universally agree exists is, is hockey sense and just sort of that on ice IQ. and. There's certain components of it that I think are captured and quantified, but it's a difficult thing and not everyone agrees exactly what it is or what it looks like, but we, we know it exists and there's, there's just certain actions that if you really watch the game, you notice a uh, defenseman goes back to break out a puck and there's just little deceptive maneuvers he has that create a little bit extra room for his partner when he makes that first pass. And little things like that I think are pretty difficult to quantify right now or deception with the eyes, whatever it may be that, um, I'd love to have some great all-inclusive, all-encompassing metric that said this player's hockey sense is X. Is it possible? I hope somebody here has the answer. <laughs> Chris, how about you? What do, we, what do we miss understanding or evaluating when we think about this game? Well, the, the one thing I think would be <clears throat> very helpful and if, if you could come up with a number that would measure sort of your heart or your, your stick to itness because I, you know, Ronnie's been fortunate to, to win Stanley Cups, but you can do the math on the Cups all you want. You have to win 16 games, it could be 28, and it could be in like 62 or 64 days at a very high level. And sooner or later, it comes down to you and someone else, and only one of you is getting the puck. And great players tend to get it more than in those situations. So if there was some way to measure, and we could know even on the amateur side, that player A is gonna do that more than player B, Sign me up for the newsletter. I'm, I'm in. So, uh, the one that's been looked at for years in performance that nobody's ever going to figure out is is predictive injury risk. Hmm. Uh, with any information that we have coming in, there's all these companies. I'm sure people in the crowd represent some of these companies that will sell that they can predict when injury is going to happen, but they're, they're, it's just not a thing. Uh, and then you know, in a, in a sport that's a team sport and and has all these athletic variables to it, like a discrete performance test or performance barrage is going to tell you success right in the NHL. If anybody can figure that out, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think these guys probably covered the, the three biggest things. Um, you know, for me, um, I'm on record as saying, and Alex and Danny and Amit and Eric have heard me say it many times, it's, uh, you know, for me, the, the analytics is a balance and check, right? I, I don't trust strictly the numbers as the be all end all and I don't trust my eyes when I watch a game as the be all end all. I try and analyze a player and look at things and then I'll compare it to the numbers and if the numbers and what I see are accurate in, in my opinion then I'm comfortable moving forward from that. If there's a discrepancy then we're going to have more dialogue or I'm going to watch more video or I'm going to watch more live games. So it's I think you, you have the ability now to collect all the data. It's the key now is how do you use that data to your advantage? And I think that's the, the biggest challenge that teams are, are trying to, there's so much, so many new avenues now that have kind of been opened up. How do you take that and, and make it to your advantage moving forward is the, is the biggest key for me. Well, let's give a great round of applause to this panel. Gentlemen, thank you all so much. We appreciate you. I saw him, where'd he go? There he is. Come on down, Mr. Brown. Y'all, 